Sure. I thought of when I was coming in, you know, when I'm reading, you know, the book and, and the Bible and the book. It's so easy for me to understand, well, yeah, okay, why didn't you get it, Israel? Hello, the prophets are talking to you, you know, God's talking to the prophets. In their day, the everyday people, God didn't talk, I mean, like God's in our hearts in Tashtas. Did he talk to them too? Well, yes. See, the, the, the prophets spoke by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was alive and well and active in throughout the entire, you know, well, throughout the entire history of the human race. But uh, the difference between then and now is that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was uh, worked entirely on special assignment, which means when God desired to speak to or through a prophet, or when God desired for his presence to be made known by the Spirit or whatever, the Holy Spirit would make that manifestation or would perform that act or provide that inspiration or whatever else it was. Once that particular task was completed, would recede again to the presence of the Father. The Holy Spirit was not a permanent fixture in the hearts of those who were obedient to God. That happened in Acts 2 at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit, as was promised by Jesus during his time on earth, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, paraclete is the theological word for it, um, came to on the disciples in uh, Acts 2 in Jerusalem. From that moment on, the gift of the Holy Spirit, not to be confused with gifts, plural, but the gift of the Holy Spirit is given to all those who, as Paul says in Romans 10, uh, confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead. So the Holy Spirit is present permanently in the lives and hearts of the people who are now followers of Jesus. The Old Testament, he came for special purposes, but was not permanently resident. I mean, the, the Holy Spirit was present as early as Genesis 1, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Right. Okay. Does that answer your question? Well, it does, but it also then makes me realize in the, when people went to the temple, because God lived in the temple, correct? Oh, correct. I mean, I mean they, believed, they believed God was everywhere, but they sort of fell into the failing of thinking because he said he was especially going to be, you know, <laughs> reside in the temple. That, that, that was the only place he was. That they fell so into the error. So then they, they really did rely on the priests to tell them what God had said. I mean, because we're talking about all the, all the bad prophets and the bad priests. Right, to a great extent. Things. Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, it was not the same kind of situation we have now. It would take a lot to unfold that in detail. Okay. <laughs> I mean, God, God had made his word known through other prophets. You know, there were um, the, the Torah, the writings of Moses were available fairly early on. Okay. Um, and so they believed that the Pentateuch, the Torah, was uh, God's word to them as given through Moses, the lawgiver. You know, they had the written law. And so they had a lot in terms of communication. But it was not the kind of intimate heart, you know, in the heart, God is present with me always kind of thing that we have. They, they did believe that the sacrificial system, the temple priests, etc., were necessary for their relationship with God, that they were mediators for them. Because so, I'm thinking about the people, there were so many people that were not literate, correct? Uh, not imagine? amongst the Jews. Oh, the the oh, Jews were all literate. That's oh. one of the things about the Jewish people is that from the very earliest day, everybody growing up, as part of their religious belief, they were taught to read the Torah, and so they were literate. Um, which was extraordinary in ancient times. Um, um, was it just the boys, or was it? Well, the, the, the boys, it was required of the boys that they learn. Uh, I think a, a lot of girls were not supposed to study Torah, but I think it was fairly common for girls to learn to read as well. And literacy, I don't think, was very common. Uh, it, it wasn't as, as much a requirement as it was for the boys. The boys had to. Right. You know, By the time they were age 13, they had to stand up in public and read from, uh, from the Torah or from the scrolls. And so that was a requirement of being part of that culture. So everybody was literate uh, in terms of males, and I think a lot of females learned to read as well, although they were not supposed to stay law. You all saw Yentl, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, where she has to pretend to be a boy because after her father dies, there's no one who can, you know, will teach her the, the law. Yes? Aren't there prophets after this? Have there been prophets throughout time? Um, well, if, if you're using the true definition of prophet, which is one who speaks for God, then yes. I mean, there are prophetic figures in the New Testament. There are, um, there are I think I could, I could find in modern religious people who would say that they fulfill the technical definition of prophet, which is one who speaks for God. Anybody who is a minister who preaches, they're supposed to be filling a prophetic role. One of the gifts of the Spirit is the gift of prophecy. So yes, anybody who practices that, that gift, which is to speak God's word to the people, is a prophet. Um, in terms of the, the, the canonical prophets, 
That is, prophets who have uh, written books that are considered part of the canon, the official documents that God has given us, the canon is closed. There have not been additional prophetic writings. But then some of the most important prophets in the Old Testament, like Elijah and Elisha, didn't write anything anyway. You know, they were entirely non-literary. Uh, literary. They were literary. They were non-literary prophets. Okay? Okay. Lots of stuff. Any other questions? All right. Let's get started. Um, well, we've already started. Let's get started with the, the stuff I was ready for. Uh, the, today we are looking at number five in the list. We are in the fifth week. Today we're going to introduce the Book of the Twelve, as the Hebrew Bible calls it, or the Minor Prophets, as it's typically called in, uh, in Christian circles. And then we're going to talk specifically about Hosea, Joel, and Amos. And I, as I've been doing for the last couple of prophets, I started out doing more of a thematic lectures, and then I decided, no, we need to dig in and look at the scripture. So what we're going to actually do is go through passages that I've selected from each of those three and then talk about what they mean and how they reflect what the prophet was, was assigned to do and that sort of thing. So today, the book of the Twelve. Um, this is something I've not shown you before, but I think it may be valuable. And again, I, I do these things for two reasons. Not only so you can see it in here, but in some ways, even more importantly, this is now online so that you have access to it. Uh, if you go to litchapala.org, all of the lectures I have done for every class are online, and all of these materials. So you, go, you can go in and look at this in either PowerPoint or, or uh, PDF and see. Now this, I think, is a very helpful little chart because it helps you remember the structure of the Old Testament. It's in a 512. It's 512, 512, 512, 5, 512. So what that means is, uh, it starts with the five books of the law, the, the uh, Torah or Pentateuch, which we had a class on Pentateuch last term. Then you have the 12, uh, what we call history books. Now this is the, the, the Christian, particularly the Protestant Christian version of the Old Testament, because we don't include the Apocrypha as does the Catholic Church. So you've got the five books of the law, books of Moses. Then you've got 12 books which we call history. Now the Jewish people call part of these, like Joshua, Judges, Ruth, they call them, they call them prophetic writings. They call them the early prophets. Okay? Then you have, in, according to the Catholic Christian version, five books which we call the books of wisdom. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. They don't, they don't convey particular historic kinds of stuff. They're books of, of wisdom and inspiration, etc. Psalms being an example people know. Then you have the five major prophets, again, according to a Protestant Christian perspective. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The Jewish Bible takes Lamentations and Daniel and put them over in the Wisdom Writings. So the Jewish Bible is organized completely differently. And then what we call the minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi, in the Hebrew Bible is one book. It's called the Book of the Twelve. And we'll talk about that for a few minutes. So, Five books of, the, of Moses, the books of the Pentateuch, 12 history books, five books of wisdom, five books of the major prophets, and 12 books of the uh, minor prophets. It's a good way to sort of understand how it's organized, I think. As long as you're not talking to a Jewish person who would not recognize this at all, because it's completely different for them. You know, they broke it, break it up into three categories. The Torah, the, the Neveim, or the prophets, which includes the early prophets, some of these and the Ketuvim, or writings. And in the writings, they include uh, Esther and Daniel and Lamentations, etc. Okay? Does that make sense? Is that helpful yeah. to you? Yeah. And then again, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the, the New Testament, 66 books total. All right. So that's there for you to reference in the future. I now want to give you a, a different version of a historic chart so you get some idea here. Um, these... Three, you, can't, you can hardly see it from back there, but you can see it if you go online. The United Kingdom under the three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. The united monarchy. Then after Solomon, because Solomon um, married foreign wives who worshipped other gods, and he not only allowed it, but apparently even encouraged it, including building places for them to worship, sacrifice children, all kinds of things. Um, you ended up with a split kingdom. The kingdom of Judah in the south, the kingdom of Israel in the north. And here are the various kings... In 722, the northern kingdom of Israel falls to Assyria. In uh, 586, the southern kingdom of uh, Judah falls to Babylon, and the J Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. Now, this middle part are the prophets. And this lists Joel, which I don't think that's where Joel should be. Joel is the one book that is most controversial in terms of timing. We'll talk about that. 
Uh, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Mike, uh, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, uh, Jeremiah, and I added Lamentations over here because we counted this because it was written by Jeremiah and it's of the same events Jeremiah covers. We include it in the major prophets usually when we talk about it. Uh, Obadiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Then down here, after the return, after the southern kingdom of Judah was destroyed by Babylon in 586, um, 60 years or so later, the uh, Persians conquered Babylon and they allowed the Jews to return. So under Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, and the prophets there were Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And the ones I have circled in green, um, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Daniel, and Ezekiel are the major prophets. So this chart is online for you to see as well. Okay? Uh, it, it lets you line up who are the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel, you know, after the split of the monarchy, who the prophets were, about what the time period was, and the leaders that, you know, during the return and all that. So there's a lot of pieces of information that kind of line up uh, chronologically here because there are dates along this side. All right, any questions about that? All the stuff you know. <laughs> and then this one, oops, um, this one you've seen before. We talked about the major prophets, which are the dotted ones. Today we're going to be talking about uh, Amos, um, Hosea, Amos, and Joel. And again, I'll talk about the fact that there's a question as to where, where Joel should be. Should it be there, or should it be over here somewhere? It's the most questioned in terms of dating. All right, now, these are the 12 minor prophets, or the book of the 12, as it is called. Today we're going to talk in general about the characteristics of the 12 uh, minor prophets, and then look at Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Hosea, the focus of Hosea, and this chart, this list has what the primary message is. Hosea is a condemnation of Israel, that is the northern kingdom. Hosea and Amos are the two prophets that were specific to the northern kingdom. In fact, you see that here. You see the northern kingdom of Israel, Amos and Hosea. Southern kingdom of Judah, pretty much everybody else until the, the you know, the, the post-exilic period in here, okay? Um, Hosea is a condemnation of the northern kingdom of Israel, but an affirmation that God's love remains and that he will redeem and restore. Joel is a three you know, very um, intense books about locusts, uh, three chapters rather. Uh, a prediction of the foreign invasion, a foreign invasion as God's judgment against the southern kingdom, we believe. And uh, the image that's used, the metaphor for the invasion and destruction of this foreign army is a... Um, a swarm of locusts that come over and destroy everything. And then Amos deals with a number of different things. I've got eight declarations of judgment against Israel. All right, So we're going to talk about those three today, and we'll pick up these others later. First, <coughs> excuse me, let's talk about the characteristics of the minor prophets. What is particular about these 12 books? Now, they're only minor in the sense of length. They vary, they, they go from uh, one chapter to 14 chapters in length. Um, and they're minor compared to the major prophets, which are much longer, which run from 48 to 66 chapters. Isaiah, the longest one, is 66 chapters. It's a huge chunk of material. Well, you compare that to the longest minor prophet at 14, and you can see the difference. So major and minor refers not to importance, but to length. It's also true that as we study the major prophets, each of the major prophets is sort of a complete package. They have the entire message, whereas the minor prophets kind of fit together in order to, um, to make the message complete. We'll discuss that. The arrangement that we find in our Bibles is roughly chronological. It begins with the prophets of the early Assyrian period, again, when the nation of Assyria was the dominant force and ended up destroying the northern kingdom. That includes Hosea, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. Then it's followed by what could be called the later Assyrian or uh, Babylonian period, when Babylon was threatening to destroy, and eventually did destroy, the southern kingdom of Judah. Those are Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And then finally, three prophets who were uh, post-exilic during the Persian period. This is after Persia defeats Babylon, and that's Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now, as I said earlier, the book of Joel is kind of an anomaly. It's undated. There is nothing in the book of Joel, it's only three chapters, that gives us a clear indication of where it should fit in Scripture. 
Um, where it's placed, which is uh, be, you know, between Hosea and Amos, it's put there, or it has traditionally been put there for two reasons. One, because there is a, a particular reference to the, the uh, roar, that, you know, that God will roar in Zion, that, that is uh, near the end of Joel, chapter 3, verse 16, and then occurs again, verbatim, and almost verbatim, in Amos 1, 2. And Joel is entirely about this locust swarm, you know, invasion of locusts, and Amos describes the plague of locusts. So there's been a sense in which there may be continuity between the end of Joel and the start of Amos. So they stick Joel in between Hosea and Amos. However, there's a controversy as to whether uh, did was Joel writing, and it's not clear, was he writing about the threat of the Assyrians destroying the northern kingdom, which means he would have been writing earlier, you know, like in the, the uh, 600s. Or is he talking about uh, the you know, late, early 600s? Or is he talking about the destruction, potential destruction of the southern kingdom by Babylon? In which case, he's, he's writing 150 years later. And so we're not really sure where that fits. We'll get into a little more detail about that and we'll see what I mean. Six of the 12 books, particularly Hosea, Amos, Micah, Zephaniah, Haggai, and Zechariah, open with specific historical superscriptions. What that means is they start out by saying, you know, uh, I'm Hosea and here's who I am, and I, was, I wrote this, or my ministry was, or God called me to prophesy during the reigns of these kings. So we know when those six occur. But then six of them have no specific historical references. We've got a pretty good idea because of who they're talking about. Joel is the confusing one because he's not very specific. It's, it's almost entirely the metaphor of the locust without saying he's speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel or he's speaking to the southern kingdom of Judah. There's a mixture in there. Um, most of them, we have a pretty good idea where they were and they fall in generally that chronological order with Joel being kind of the, the, strange, um, the strange one in there. Now, it was very customary up until the last quarter century or so, the last 25 years or so, for scholarship to study the 12 minor prophets. And I'm talking here about Christian scholarship, uh, not Jewish scholarship. We've said before, if you took the Old Testament theology class, Old Testament theology is a uniquely Christian pursuit because there is no Old Testament to the Hebrew, to Jewish scholars. It's all their Bible. And so it's just biblical theology. But in terms of the way Christian scholars have approached the Book of the Twelve, or the Twelve Minor Prophets, until very recently there was an emphasis on them individually. They looked at each of the books individually, they identified their historical context, what their focus was, who they were talking to, because they thought that was the way to get most at the meaning for each book. And that kind of thinking is why in our Bible they're, they're separate books, whereas in the Hebrew Bible they're all together as one, the Book of the Twelve. In fact, the most ancient scrolls that we have, Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, um, we actually have some, some pieces, some fragments, where the end of one minor prophet is on the same piece of scroll as the start of the next one, which indicates to us that they were all put together on one scroll as well. They were, they were seen as one thing. The interesting thing is, even in Christian uh, biblical theology nowadays, and in, in uh, biblical studies, the most recent idea is that the Hebrews had it right all along, duh. That in fact, to get the correct theological understanding of the 12 minor prophets, you have to look at them together. Um, we said when we're talking about the major prophets, that there, for instance, is a, a three-point message. The prophetic message of the books of the prophets in the Old Testament are, one, you've broken my covenant and you better repent. Two, if you haven't repented, then there's judgment coming. And three, even though there's judgment, there will be restoration at the end. Well, now, some of the minor prophets have all three of those. But there are some of them that emphasize much more heavily the first one, that is, the break breaking of the covenant for, for various reasons, or much more so judgment is here, um, a war of restoration. If you take the Book of the Twelve together, they are a very complete kind of picture and story and theological presentation in much the way that the major prophets are. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, for instance, they're the whole package. They're the whole picture. They give you the whole message. They talk about the three great sins the prophets are talking about. The sin of idolatry, the sin of injustice against those who are weak and in need, and the sin of, of um, ritualistic worship instead of true heartfelt worship. 
Well, some of the minor prophets deal with one or two of those, um, and then others deal with different parts of it. But if you look at them all together, they, they form a complete package in much the same way that the major prophets each does. Does that make sense? So scholars in recent, more recent years have much more been inclined to see the 12 minor prophets the way the Hebrew scholars have always seen them, and that is as one big book that was contributed to by different authors. And there are themes. There's even, even more. I mentioned that uh, at the end of Joel and the start of Amos, there are phrases that are the same. <clears throat> there are major themes that carry through, and more and more and more, as scholars have stepped back and looked at this, they've said, this makes a whole lot more sense if we looked at this as an interconnected set of theological messages, and that there are bridges in between various of these books so that they're not individual. Because I can't talk about all 12 at one time, I am going to break them up some. Okay, we're going to talk about them a few at a time because there's just too much to try to cover at one time. But I mentioned this already, and that is, taken together, the Book of the Twelve fulfills the three-part prophetic message found in the major prophets. That is, you, Israel, Judah, and some of them talk to Israel, some talk to Judah, some talk to both. You have broken the covenant, you had better repent. Second point, no repentance, then there is judgment, and judgment will also come not only on you, but on all the nations. We often think about the fact that, you know, the, as we've said, the promise to Abraham was that I will bless you and make you a great people, and through you all the people of the earth will be blessed. When he renewed the covenant with Isaac, he said the same thing. Through you all the people will be blessed. And to Jacob, through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, that idea that God is going to, through the Jewish people, is going to bless all the nations of the earth. And Paul is very clear that the way he's done that for Christians is that we are adopted into the family. We are adopted or grafted. He talks about being grafted onto the vine. We are adopted into the promise that God gave to the Israelites. So we become part of that family. We're all honorary Jews. And that's how it works for us to be part of it. But the flip side, which you see in the prophetic writings, is that the judgment that Israel and Judah are due for their failings, other nations also are going to receive judgment. So it works both ways. There is an inclusion on the positive side, and there's also an inclusion on the negative side. We will be blessed along with the people of Israel, and we will receive curses. Some of it because of how the various Gentile nations had treated the Israelites, some of it because of just injustice and sin and our own you know, failings of the various nations. But there's a lot in here. Uh, we mentioned that each one of the major prophets, the, at least Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, all have oracles against the nations where they list specific nations and what bad things God is going to do to them because of how they've acted. Well, we also get those kinds of oracles, mostly shorter, the same kind of idea in the Minor Prophets as well. There is a major emphasis in, um, on the character of God through all of this, the character of God being the focal point around which the judgments are made. Now, and when I say that all three of these, you know, the, the idea of broken the covenant, better repent, no repentance than judgment, but there is restoration. If you go through the minor prophets, thinking of them all as one, they give you the whole picture. But if you look at them more individually, uh, Hosea through Micah are mostly just the warnings. You know, it's kind of number one more than anything else. Um, Nahum through Zephaniah, the dominant message is judgment, as though the focus is on number two. And then the last sections, the post-exilic prophets, Haggai through Malachi, are all about redemption and restoration. So when you look at these 12, they sort of break out into focusing primarily on these three major prophetic points. All right? Questions about any of that in terms of the general characteristics of the 12? Were they arranged like that based on those, those observations? Well, we, be possibly, we believe possibly so. Well, and we believe that with the possible exception of Joel, they're pretty much in chronological order. And so it appears as though God, the Holy Spirit, in His wisdom, inspired over a period, there was a period of time in which the primary message for the minor prophets was the first. Not entirely, not exclusively, but primarily the first of these three points. And then there was a period of time in which it was more emphasis on the second, and then a period of time in the post exilic prophets, when it was very much more a focus on restoration and redemption. Yes? Uh, did the other nations have any idea that they... And they were going to get their bums kicked? Yeah. Is that what you're trying to say? Um, there are some that were, for instance, you know, we read in Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar, um, two different times, Nebuchadnezzar declares his faith in the one true God, the God of Israel. First, the fiery furnace event, you know, where he recognizes that this must be the real God who was able to do this for, for Shechemed, 
shake a bed, make a bed, and a bed we go. Show very good shake a bed we go. Um, and then later on, he his pride drives him mad, and it's only when he acknowledges the one true so the sovereignty of the one true God that he regains his sanity and regains his throne. So we know that there were. Uh, Jonah goes to Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, and he preaches, and all of Nineveh is converted. You know, you have to think Jeremiah speaking to Jews for 51 years, I think it was, and almost nobody would listen to it. Jonah reluctantly goes to Nineveh, and it, it almost sounds as though he preaches once, and the whole city converts. In fact, it, it makes him so mad they convert so easily, he stomps his little feet and gets mad at God over it. And so you've got this inequity where the Jews are so hardened into their ways and will not accept the message of the Lord, and yet you've got Assyrians, you've got Babylonians, you've got other peoples who are. It's also true that many of the people we talk about here are um, relatives of the Jews. You know, they're Semitic people. For instance, the Jewish people obviously are all descended from Abraham, you know, through Isaac. Well, you remember that Abraham's nephew was Lot. Remember Lot, Sodom, and the whole thing? You know, pillar of salt for a wife and all of that? Well, Lot, two of his children, illegitimate children, became the ancestors of the nations of Ammon and Moab. So these are Semitic peoples, not of the line of Isaac, not of the, you know, the, the, the line of the chosen people, uh, Isaac and Jacob, but they are relatives. And, then, and so they had some historical knowledge, some connection to the sense of Abraham as well. Um, you've got Edom descended from Esau. Same basic family, all right? One of Esau, no, instead of Jacob, it's Esau. Even the Muslims. Well, and the Arabic peoples, you know, um, as well, are descended from Hagar, you know, uh, and Ishmael. So, yeah, you've got, you've got, there's a lot of interconnections in here. And so there was a lot of awareness. The, you know, the... The prophets are honored in the, the in the Islam, uh, in the Quran. Do not make a mistake of saying I'm saying that's all the same as ours. Okay, but Mary is considered a virgin. Jesus is considered a prophet. Many of the prophets of the Old Testament. In fact, um, Muhammad said that the, th the thing that was wrong with the Jewish people and the Christian people is that they didn't really listen to the ancient prophets. If they really listened to the prophets of God, they would have gotten it right. But Muhammad said. You've messed everything up, we've got to start all over again, and that's what Islam was all about. Now, we don't think that's correct, but that is what Islam says. But they honored the ancient prophets. So there was a lot of, you know, a lot of understanding of that. All right? Okay. I'm actually not going to tell the photograph joke that I always tell when I <laughs> show these images. Uh, these, these are hard to see back there. There are three different sort of styles of art. This is an image of Hosea. This is Michelangelo's Joel in the Sistine Chapel. And this is a uh, Byzantine, a Greek sort of uh, version of Amos. We don't have a lot of details of what these guys look like. Um, but that gives you sort of an idea that they are honored and recognized. So let's talk about the first of these, the book of Hosea, all right? <coughs> Uh, Hosea is presented to us as the son of Beeri, and we're going to look at, uh, at that in just a minute. And he talks specifically about when it was that he was a prophet because he tells us what kings were ruling, and we know when those kings were ruling. So the dates of his activity is most of the 8th century. Um, certainly the writing uh, takes place between 755 and 715 B.C., but his ministry was was not quite as long as Jeremiah's, but um, several decades. All right? So he was very involved in, in this case, 40 years of ministry. Uh, his focus was the northern kingdom of Israel. The theme is that Israel will be judged, but God's love remains, and God will redeem his people eventually. And again, you'll remember we talked about in the major prophets, and this is true in the minor prophets as well, um, we see the theme of the remnant that even though God judges, even though there will be destruction and judgment on the majority of the people, God will not completely blot out his covenant people. There will always be a small number of them, the remnant, who will be preserved and brought back into the faith. And that's a very important concept. When we talk about how can God be saying all this horrible stuff about all the things he's going to do, this judgment and destruction and da 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 and yet he's got these restoration things, well, that restoration may only be for a very small number relatively small number, small percentage, which are the remnant from which the true faith will again be rebuilt. Okay? 
purpose to show God's faithfulness to an unfaithful people through Hosea's marriage. And the outline, there really are two sections. The first one is kind of a, a biographical, symbolic representation, um, which and scholars disagree over whether this, this is real, this really happened, and that this being Hosea's marriage to Gomer, a woman who was a unfaithful and is called a prostitute. She may actually have been a prostitute. Scholars disagree whether she became unfaithful after she was married to Hosea or whether Hosea married her knowing she was already like that. But the first three chapters have to do with the marriage as a symbol of God's faithfulness and the unfaithfulness of the people of Israel. Um, the prophet Hosea is told to marry an unfaithful woman, Gomer, and then she continues to be unfaithful to him as a very literal symbol. You know, it's not even a symbol, it's a practical application of what the relationship is between God and his people. This theme of Israel as an adulterous wife <clears throat> occurs elsewhere, but in Hosea, God tells Hosea to actually live this out in his relationship with a woman. Um, and then the chapters 4 through 14 are various um, speeches, oracles, various other kind of things having to do with the adulter uh, adulterous Israel and the faithfulness of God. Now, the uh, I'll deal with I'll deal with the timing in just a second with something else. This time period, because Isaiah or Hosea, I mean, uh, was a prophet over probably four decades or so, not quite as long as Jeremiah, as I said. But he started prophesying when Israel was quite strong and Assyria was quite weak. Well, over that 40-year period or so, Israel got weaker and Assyria got stronger, which eventually led to the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel by the Assyrians. So there was a shift that occurred over that. Now, you'll remember I mentioned the, the uh, Syro-Ephraimite War. What happened was when the northern kingdom of Israel, early on in this period, when they were feeling their oaks, they were feeling very powerful and very strong, they wanted to um, rebel against Assyria, which technically had control over the area, over the region. And so they got this, the, the nation of Syria right next to them to, to join with them, and they're going to rebel. And so they go to the southern kingdom of Israel and say, will you join us in rebelling against Assyria? Well, the southern kingdom of Judah at that time was quite weak, and they said no. We're not willing to do that because we, you know, we fear what's going to happen. Well, as a result, the northern kingdom of Israel and the, the nation of Syria, which is the Syr uh, Syrio-Ephraimite, the northern kingdom of Israel often is called Ephraim because the largest of the tribes in the north was the tribe of Ephraim, that they got together and attacked the southern kingdom of Judah. And because the southern kingdom of Judah is weak, they didn't know that they had any options, so they called Assyria. Hello? Syria, these guys are attacking us. We're subject to you. We need you to protect us. That's what caused Assyria to come back in in force into the region and end up eventually in the 722 destroying the northern kingdom of Israel. Because Israel and Syria had gotten together and attacked the kingdom of Judah, and Judah asked Assyria for help. And the help ended up being the destruction of the northern kingdom. Got that? So this whole time period is a very tumultuous one. When Hosea is, is prophesying, because it was that whole period when um, Israel in the north, the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria attacked Judah. Judah calls on Assyria. Assyria comes in, attacks and destroys the northern kingdom of Israel, and then later comes south and tries to attack the southern kingdom of um, Judah. And that's when Isaiah the prophet tells Hezekiah the king, don't give in. And the next morning, 185,000 Assyrians woke up to find themselves dead. Um, and, then, and then the king, at that point, it was Sennacherib. He heads back home because of having lost a big chunk of his army. Okay, but that's, <coughs> that's what's happening in this time period. So, Questions about that? Yes. Um, you know, the kingdoms, the different kingdoms, like well, Judah and Ephraim, they all recognize they come from the same family, the same connection. Yep. And they still felt it the they were two nations. each other. They yeah. were two different nations. Um, but but they came from the same line. Yeah. Right? Um, it's they just, is it politics? You, you could say, well, the United States came out of Britain, and yet we fought two wars with them. One the war of Independence, okay. and another the war of 1812. Okay. Um, 
it's, it's, you can start in the same place and end up very different places. And so they had reached the place at, at various times during the history of the split kingdoms, you know, from the time of, uh, after Solomon's death, the, the first division into two, until the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel in 722, they, the, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah had very mixed relationships. There were times when they were working together, and they would even fight together. There were times when they were, they, you know, would, would ally with enemies. There were times when, like in the Syria, Syria Ephraimite War, when they actually were fighting against each other, and it was always back and forth. Even though, I mean, it's it's like two brothers who, you know, one fought for the North in the Civil War, and one fought for the South in the Civil War. You've got different ideals, and so you you take a different approach. So that was very much what was going on with the Northern and Southern Kingdom, and particularly um, they had developed very specific religious differences because the Northern Kingdom of Israel did not have the Temple and Jerusalem. They invented their own way of worship. In fact, one of the first things that Jeroboam the first, who was the first king of the North, because they didn't could, you know, they no longer had access to the temple, first thing he did was he set up golden calves at Dan and Bethel and said, here are your gods, Scripture says. And the people started worshiping those gods. Later on, it got even worse. You know, the Samaritans, um, after, after the destruction by Assyria and then people came back, they changed the Torah. You know, they, they had I told you they had 11 commandments. One of them said that God said it was okay to worship on the Mount Gerizim, right outside the city of Samaria, instead of worshiping the temple. So it got very confused and very mixed up. But from the very start after the split, there were strong differences in terms of religion. And the northern kingdom never had a decent king in terms of decent being wanting to follow God. The southern kingdom had a few. Um, Josiah was very good. Hezekiah was pretty good. You know, they had some bad ones too. But they had kings that were really trying to worship God, trying to bring the people in the right direction. And that was back in the day when the kings were the ones that led the worship. They're the ones that decided what direction the people were going to go in. The northern kingdom never had anybody who did anything to help in terms of the worship of God. And so there were always those conflicts. Well, right? Yes. Recently I was, I was reading, just to add to the confusion, <coughs> to the confusion of all this interchange, uh, there were even some from the north that that defected to the south in the reign of Asa yeah. because they saw God was with him and so they just left their heritage and came down there and, and lived in the south. Right, and there were there were refugees, you know, approaching the time of the destruction of Jerusalem fairly moved the south as well. Now just just pockets and groups and families and stuff. It wasn't a, it's not like one of the ten tribes in the north the whole tribe decided to go south. But yeah, there were people who recognized there were problems all along through this whole process. So good. All right. Let's start looking at the book of Hosea. This is from the first chapter, starting with the first verse. <coughs> the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Geri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Joahash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Deblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu, Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. We'll come back and talk about what that means. <coughs> Excuse me. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhama, which means not loved. I just like a name like that. Um, For I will no longer show love to Israel, that I, should be at, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. After she, was, she had weaned Lo Ruhama, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo-Ami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Now you remember that the primary um, principle of the covenant that God established with Abraham and after it was, I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. I will make you the father of, many, of a great nation, and I will give you a land for your very own. 
the idea of I will be your God and you will be my people were, was so foundational to what the promise to Abraham and that was renewed all the way down through the history of the, of the Israel, uh, Israelites is when it says, for you are not my people, I am not your God, that is God saying, I repeal my covenant with you as a people. I withdraw our arrangement. In a very, and that's, there's nothing more significant that, than that in terms of the, um, for the Israelites and their relationship with God. Now, um, starting out, the word of the Lord came to Hosea, uh, son of Mary, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, he and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Those were kings of the uh, southern kingdom. And during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Joahaz, king of Israel. Now, there were six kings of the northern kingdom of Israel while uh, Hosea was a prophet. And of those, three of them had become kings by violence, by, by assassinating their predecessor. It was not a happy place, the northern kingdom. And yet, even though Hosea is a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel, he identifies the historical superscription here, as it's called, which means the historical sort of markers. He doesn't even bother listing the kings of the south, either because they were such horrible people, kings, you don't want to mention them, or it may have been that Hosea, like so many others, didn't believe any of the kings of the south, of the north, I'm sorry, any of the kings of the north were legitimate. None of them were of the line of David, for instance. And so they were not in fulfillment of God's plan. So it may be that that's why. So even though Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom, he uses the, the list of southern kings in order to identify the time period in which he's working. He only mentions one, uh, Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. Only one king, but as I say, there were five and perhaps six, depending upon where you draw the boundaries, who were kings of the north during that time period. Those those prophets, <coughs> those minor prophets that identified where they were in the reigns of the kings, did mm -hmm. most of them follow that pattern and use the kings of Judah instead of the kings? Of well, the only yeah, the only there's only two who were prophets to the north, and that was um, Hosea and um, Amos. So everybody else would have used the southern kings anyway because that's who they were, they were speaking to. Okay. Now, it says, uh, the Lord began to speak through Hosea. The Lord said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children. Um, again, some scholars say they think that Gomer was not promiscuous until after Mary. Well, this indicates to me that no, she was already, she was already promiscuous. She was already probably a prostitute when God told Hosea to go and marry her. Um, this... Hosea was one of the favorite books of my preaching mentor, E.P. Watson, and he used to love to preach on this, and he, one of his favorite lines was that, if, that God's relationship with Israel, as exemplified by Hosea and Gomer, that if God had to choose a theme song for this time period, it would be, um, uh, can't help loving that man of mine. <laughs> that, that this is the kind of relationship that the Israelites had treated him like a prostitute, like an adulterous woman when he had been faithful. Uh, so he marries her, she conceives and bears him a son, and when it says call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jez Jezreel. Jehu was um, an ancestor of the king of Israel. Um, he had killed Ahab's son Joram, this is in 2 Kings 9. He had murdered the whole family. Right? Jehu, who was known to be a one wild chariot driver, okay? Uh, he was just crazed driver. In fact, I think I've said before, there was a sort of a new age punk band called Drives Like Jehu. There was a band called Jerk Drives Like Jehu. Well, the idea was that Jehu, because he had massacred um, Ahab's son Joram and the entire family, that God is going to judge them for that. And in saying that he's going to judge them for that, it means judgment against the whole, um, the whole royal household of the northern kingdom because Jehu was the, the predecessor to the current kings. Well, Gomer has several children. One of them is called Jezreel, as a symbol of the fact that God is going to judge the northern kingdom of Israel. Then Lo Ruhama, which means not loved. And then um, Lo Ami, which means not my people. God clearly is sending a message. And he is doing, you will remember in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was told to do things like, like wear a yoke as a sign of the yokes that the people were going to wear when, um, when Babylon conquered them. And to lay on his side for a period of time. You know, uh, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel had these visual examples that they were supposed to do. Well, it doesn't get much more visual than the idea that you're going to marry a woman who's a prostitute and she's going to continue to be unfaithful. And when she has children by you, 
you hope by you, um, that they're going to give them names like not my people, not loved, etc. It's a symbol of that. Now, sounds pretty horrible, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, right after verse 9, we have this. Yet, here's the restoration part. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said of them, you are not my people, he just said that, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader, so eventually there will be unification of the two nations again, and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Say of your brothers, remember it was the son who was called not my people, and the daughter who was called not loved. Say of your, my, your brothers, my people, and of your sisters, my loved one. Exactly the opposite of what he has just declared <clears throat> symbolically in the names of the children of Hosea and Gomer. This is an example where you get this horrendous kind of judgment language, and, and symbolically and literally, and then God will come back in with this thing, but you know, I, I can't help loving that man of mine. Still, there will come a time, after all of this, there will come a time when there is restoration. And those who were known as not my people will be called my people. Those who were known as not loved will be called my loved one. Yes? So, um, Israel having come back together again in 1948, is that confusing to some of the Jews? That maybe do some of them believe that, okay, he has restored us? Well, it's confusing to everybody. Uh, <laughs> the, the promise to the Jewish people is not just that the nation will be reestablished, but that the Jewish people will be called from all corners of the world, that they will all be brought back together, and that they will all believe in him. There's, and that's not just Old Testament, it's New Testament as well, you know, read Romans. Um, there, there is the promise that there will be a renewed faith amongst the Jewish people. The Jewish people are, uh, as a whole, I mean, obviously they're a very godly and very committed Jewish people, but as a whole, the Jewish people right now are about as secular as any single group in the world. Um, and yet, the promise is that not, you know that there will their land will be reestablished, and the, many Jews believe that's what happened in the 1940s because the nation of Israel was reestablished. Um, that's one of the reasons. That's why they then had the law of return passed, which means any Jewish person from anywhere in the world can return to Israel and get his, uh, Israeli citizenship, with one exception. They passed a second law and said, if you're a Christian Jew, you can't. They will not accept Messianic Jews. Um, but the idea is that's, that's an expectation of the fulfillment of the promise that Jews from all over the world will return to Israel. In fact, that is happening more and more. It's just in the last two years, there are now more Jews inside Israel than any other one location. There used to be more Jews in New York City than anywhere. But there are now more Jews inside Israel than any other single nation in the world. Um, and that's growing all the time because more people are returning, um, etc. So it is confusing. People don't, I think that, again, most Jews are secular and they would say, hey, it's great we've got a nation again, but eh, I don't know about the prophetic thing. But they would, uh, some of them would say very much so, this is the beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecies. Uh, both Old Testament and New Testament prophecies about the return of the Jew and the faith of the Jew, that God still has a plan for them. He still has an intention. And we believe that that plan must involve some aspect of believing that the Messiah Jesus really has come. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Uh, and that that's what the faith will be, the faith that they will gain faith in the fact that the Messiah that the Jews, the believing Jews, have expected for, you know, 3,000 years now, um, that he's come back. His name is Jesus. So we'll see what, what happens with that. It is a very complicated thing when you start trying to, me to mesh geopolitical historical realities from modern times with biblical prophecy. It's a very hard, you know, the gears don't always line up exactly, and yet people try to force them. Okay. So you've got to be careful. All right? Um, okay, let's keep going. From Hosea 2. Uh, starting with the fourth verse. I will sh I will not show. Now he's he said. I'm not going to love them. Now there will come a time. Yes. Yes. Oh, right before that last slide, you said you were going to explain what breaking the bowl of the... Uh, that simply meant... Um, yeah, the Valley of Jezreel, that's where the judgment will take place. And when he says he's going to, to uh, 
put an end to the kingdom of Israel, break Israel's bow, it, it means they're going to be defeated. Um, they're going to be they're going to be destroyed. When you talk about breaking the bow, it means they're gonna they're gonna this gonna have them defeated. Uh, their bows are gonna break. And uh, his his intention was to do that through the which he did through the Assyrian people. Okay. All right. Um, Isaiah two, starting with verse four. He backs up again and restates the judgment. I will not show my love to her children because they are the children of adultery. You almost see God, you know, arguing with himself over this. They deserve the judgment. They're going to get the judgment, but I still love them, you know? They've been so horrible. It's like an adulterous wife. I, I'm going to have to judge them, but I still love them, okay? You get that. Their mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me my food and my water, my wool and my linen, my olive oil and my drink. Now, you need to understand that Baal and many of the gods of the Canaanites, which is when we talk about, I'll go after my lovers who give me all of these things, it means worshiping other gods. Because remember, the idolatry of the Israelites is symbolized by the adulterous wife, meaning they've gone after other gods instead of you know, a wife going after other men. Most of the uh, Canaanite gods were agricultural gods. They were gods that was, you know, this was true for uh, Asherah, it's true for Baal, it was true for Tammuz that we heard about in Ezekiel. Um, they were thought to be the ones that you prayed to if you wanted to get grain, if you wanted to get olive oil, if you wanted to get, you know, food products. And so that's why the reference here is, go after my lovers who give me my food, my water, my wool, my linen, my oil, olive oil, my drink. That was the nature, they thought, of the Canaanite gods and the ones that Gomer is symbolizing when she chases other men. Okay? Therefore, I will block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. Now, recognize, idolatry was supposed to be punished with death. Adultery was punishable by death. But here, God is not saying, I will destroy her. I will, for her adultery, I will destroy them for their idolatry. He instead says, I will block their path so that they can't do this. I will prevent them from doing it rather than judge them for having done it. Okay? She will chase after her lovers but not catch them. She will look for them but not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my husband as at first, for then I was better off than now. She has not acknowledged that I, that's God, was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine and oil, who lavished on her the silver and the gold which they used for Baal. In other words, God gives all those things, and yet they take them out and they offer them in sacrifice to pagan gods, to the Canaanite gods, Baal being the, you know, one of the foremost Canaanite gods. <coughs> okay? Let's keep going. Further in chapter 2, and I, again, I can't do all of these, so I've picked passages that I think convey the important parts of the message. Again, we come back to the restoration. You know, we've had judgment, then restoration. Judgment, now we come back to restoration again. In that day... A later day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. The Hebrew word for master is Baal. The same name as the Canaanite gods. Or Lord. Isn't that well, it's Lord or master. Yeah. Um, so, there's a word play here. I will remove the names of the Baals from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds in the sky, and the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. One of God's promises for the eventual um, reunion and restoration is that there will be no, no life-threatening circumstances from animals or from war or from anything else. I will betroth you to me forever. Here's this marriage symbolism again. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one called, not my loved one. I will say to those called, not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. That picks up the original covenant promise. I will be your God, and you will be my people. Again, here we have restoration. After judgment, there is restoration. And so we get this back and forth kind of thing. You'll notice that there are five attributes that God says will be characteristic of the, 
of the relationship, of the covenant relationship that will be reestablished. Those attributes are righteousness, justice, love, compassion, and faithfulness. That's what our relationship with God will be when the covenant is renewed in the time of restoration. All right? So you see the back and forth here. Yes? I'm trying not to ask this question, but it's been bothering me ever since I read it. When she named her children those not very nice names, in that day, did they kind of follow their names? I mean, was it like a curse? Well, she didn't name them. He did. The father was the one to pick the name. You remember when John the Baptist, um, when they were, he's born and they want to name him, and Elizabeth says his name is John, and they go, whoa, wait a minute, you don't have any relatives named John. You can't do that. They go to his father, Zachariah, and they make, they make signs to him. Apparently they thought he was deaf. He wasn't deaf, he was just mute. Um, and they make signs, and what is his name? And he writes, on a, he writes on a tablet, his name is John. Because it was the father that had the right to decide. And because it was the prophet, Hosea, that God was speaking through, he's the one that gave him the names. Now, because we have examples here that, you know, they, that they would still be loved, they would still be cared for, we don't have any other details about that. But there's no, so we don't know, were they, you know, were they, Scarred for life? Did they actually live that out in their life? You know, um, the, what happened to the kid that somebody named Adolf Hitler a few years ago, right? Um, and I think they ended up taking the kids away from the family. <laughs> but what's that going to do to that kid as he gets older? You know, um, we don't know. We don't have any details about that here. Uh, but it was clearly a symbol. There's no indication that they, the kids necessarily would have been treated differently because of that. Uh, the very fact of their name was the point. Yes? When I read that passage, I first took that question, and then I said, no, there's so much of this practice happening in the countryside mm -hmm. that to call these people awful names is just facing reality, sort yeah. of like a reality check, you know, that only, the, it was the population in general who needed the reality check. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was a message that whether it, it ended up manifesting in the lives of those children, we don't have any details. Okay? <coughs> the Lord said to me, go, show your love to your wife again. And after all this, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes, which were used as offerings to the agricultural, you know, the, the gods. Um, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way towards you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. Now, God says to Hosea, Gomer has run off and apparently has really gotten herself in a mess because she's been sold into slavery. Which means she ran up debts, she couldn't pay, or she created... She did some crime, something else that caused her to become a slave. Because when God tells uh, Hosea, go find her, go get her back, he has to go and purchase her back. He gave 15 shekels of silver. Now, that was uh, 30 shekels of silver was considered a standard purchase price for a slave back then. But in addition to the 15 shekels of silver, he also had to pay a homer and a lethic of barley, which is about 430 pounds which probably would have been equal to about 15 shekels of silver. So the idea is that 30 shekels total, approximately. And he says, okay, you're coming home with me. We're going to live together as husband and wife again. You're not going to be a prostitute, and I am not going to run around with other women, which men consider that their right back then. But he promises, he pledges, that he will be faithful to her as well. And again, we get this sense that the Israelites... This is all a symbol of the Israelites and the idea that eventually they will give up false sacrifice, sacred stones. The ephod would, would have been um, a, a pagan priest's outfit, basically. Uh, household gods, they will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, meaning the descendant of David, the one that was promised to be king, and come trembling to the Lord and do his blessings in the last days. Now you'll notice, verse 5, afterwards the Israelites will return. The word return is very important, not only in Hosea, 
but in most of the prophets. We've said before that the idea is for the Jews is that salvation is a return from exile. So the concept of the return, in fact, I said a minute ago, the law in Israel that anybody who wants can, who's Jewish, can come back to Israel and become uh, an Israeli citizen without other requirements, that is called the law of return in Israel. So the idea of the Jews returning is a huge theological theme for them. Okay? All right. Let's pick up in Hosea 5. Again, looking at the, the judgment. I'm going to move fairly quickly through the rest of Hosea. A few examples from Joel and then Amos. Okay? Chapter 4, which I've skipped over here, is actually very interesting because it deals with what amounts to a lawsuit. That God files a lawsuit against the nation of Israel for their lack of faithfulness. Uh, and it starts out by saying, I have a charge to bring against you. Then we get to chapter 5, um, and we read this, starting at the 13th verse. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his sores, then Ephraim turned to Assyria and sent to the great king for help. But he is not able to cure you, and not able to heal your sores. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a great lion to Judah. I will tear them to pieces and go away. I will carry them off with no one to rescue them. Then I will return to my lair until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. Now a lion was by far, and they had lions in, in the Middle East in those days. They don't anymore. Uh, but a lion was considered by far the most dangerous animal. It was the scariest image. And that's why when they talk about a lion, it's meant to be the most fearsome thing that you can imagine. When it says Ephraim, remember he's talking about the northern kingdom of Israel. Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his sores. Then Ephraim turned to Assyria. You'll remember that the northern kingdom was destroyed by Assyria after the southern kingdom of Judah appealed to them. But before the actual destruction, during that time period, the northern kingdom tried to buy off Assyria. They paid tribute on at least two occasions that we know of to Tiglath-Pileser III, which is still like my favorite name in history. <laughs> Tiglath-Pileser III. Um, they bribed him twice, but that tribute was not sufficient. And eventually the Assyrians, there wasn't enough to keep them back, and they ended up destroying the northern kingdom and taking the people off into slavery. So. Um, that's what it's talking about when it says Ephraim turned to Assyria. He's not able to cure you, not able to heal you. And God here is basically saying that even though it may appear that the judgment and the destruction is coming through human armies or even wild beasts or something else, that it is God who punishes, even if he uses other agents to manifest it, that he will be like the lion to Ephraim. And then once his judgment is there, he will withdraw to his lair, meaning uh, return to his lair, which means withdraw from Israel, remove his presence from them, until they have borne their guilt, experience the consequences, and choose to seek his face in their misery to seek God again. So this is the judgment against them. Again, judgment. Now, guess what happens? Restoration. Restoration. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I kill you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. As at Adam, which is a place, not a person. As at Adam, they have broken the covenant. They were unfaithful to me there. Gilead is a city of evildoers, stained with the footprints of blood. As marauders lie in ambush for a victim, so do bands of priests. Okay? The priests are bad guys. They murder on the road to Shechem, carrying out their wicked schemes. I have seen the horrible thing in Israel. There Ephraim is given a prostitution. Israel is defiled. Also for you, Judah, a harvest is appointed. Okay, we'll get to the restoration. It isn't here yet. Um, the idea that your love, your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. It's not true repentance. It's not true love for God. It's like whatever that show was where somebody, she said, well, you told me you loved me. What was it, like a, a viral love, a 24-hour thing? Okay. <laughs> That's sort of what God is saying about the, the Israelites here. And so he has used his prophets to denounce them, to cut them to pieces with words, to pronounce his judgments on them. And he says here again, you will remember that um, the three sins that, that the people were guilty of. One was idolatry, not serving the one true God, but other gods. Secondly, 
uh, unrighteous and not caring for the needs of those who couldn't care for themselves. And thirdly, it was ritualism, just going through the motions of the religion and not really believing God. So he says, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. No ritualism, and I, I want you to care for people in need. The word here of mercy is hesed in Hebrew. It literally means kindness to neighbor, to a neighbor, or showing of love. Okay. Um, he gives some examples, which, which we find in uh, Second Kings and Judges, of places where they actually played out um, their awfulness, and says these are just examples of the horrible things in Israel, the prostitution of Ephraim, the defiling of Israel. And then he goes on to talk about them more. Ephraim, again, that's the nation of Israel, mixes with the nations. Ephraim is a flat loaf, not turned over. Foreigners sap his strength, but he does not realize it. His hair is sprinkled with gray, but he does not notice. I don't know that there's anything wrong with that. So. <laughs> Israel's arrogance testifies against him, but despite all this, he does not return to the Lord his God or search for him. Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived and senseless, now calling to Egypt, now turning to Assyria. I'll tell you what that means. Woe to them because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them because they have rebelled against me. I long to redeem them. But they speak about me falsely. They do not cry out to me from their hearts, but wail on their beds. They slash themselves, appealing to their gods for grain and new wine, but they turn away from me. I train them and strengthen their arms, but they plot evil against me. They do not turn to the Most High. They are, take, they are like a faulty bow. This is the mark. Their leaders will fall by the sword because of their insolent words. For this they will be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. Okay, a couple things here. Ephraim mixes with nations. Part of that means that they were accepting the gods of the other nations surrounding them. Part of that means that they were looking to political treaties to protect them instead of turning to God. Uh, this even Hezekiah, the good king of, the, of Judah in the south, he got messed up for a while thinking he could strike deals and treaties in order to protect himself. And finally, Isaiah convinced him, no, you have to rely on God. Um, Ephraim is a flat loaf, not turned over. Okay, they used to cook on, on rocks that they would have a fire under. You take a piece of bread and you put it on a, on, on a hot rock, what's going to happen to it if you don't turn it over? Burns on one side and stays raw on the other. It, it's a symbol of being unwise, you know, of, not, of not being wise in how you take care of things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived and senseless, now calling to Egypt, now turning to Assyria. You will remember that during the Assyrian phase, the two great powers, which were sort of back and forth, were Assyria and Egypt. And they were always playing against one another. Later on, the two great powers were Babylon and Egypt. And the fall of the southern kingdom of Judah in the five, 586 was because various factions would think, okay, this, uh, Babylon's getting weaker, and so we're going to side with Egypt. And then Egypt would get defeated in a battle, and they go, oh, well, Egypt's not winning. We better side with Assyria again. And they went back and forth until finally Nebuchadnezzar marched in and just cleaned the whole thing out. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing was happening in this period with the northern kingdom of Israel between Egypt and Assyria. And that's what it's talking about now calling to Egypt, now turning to Assyria. Um, <laughs> And God says, I want to redeem them. My heart is to take care of these people, but they, but they speak falsely about me. They will not turn to me. They do not cry out to me from their hearts, but wail on their beds. They slash themselves. The book of Deuteronomy specifically commanded that you not cut yourselves as part of a religious service, because they used to do that. You remember that when Elijah is, is has, having a conflict with the prophets of Baal, they screamed and yelled and banged drums and cymbals and slashed themselves. That was part of a pagan worship. It also says, do not get tattoos. That way, Deuteronomy, don't get tattoos on your body. Um, we'll take confession later. For you. Um, that's the Old Testament. We're not on the law anymore, but still, probably a good idea. Um, appealing to their gods for grain and new wine. Remember, this was these were agricultural gods, primarily in Canaan. They appealed to those gods for, for grain and new wine, which means grapes, but they would squeeze. But God will uh, break them. They are a faulty bow. They miss the mark. They will be broken. Um, and for this, they will be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. Egypt, for instance, when they were going back and forth, Egypt kept promising, at this time, Israel in the north. Later, Judah and the south say, oh, we'll protect you. We'll come to your defense. Well, then the Assyrians show up outside Israel, and Egypt goes, eh, not so much. 
So the idea of being ridiculed in Egypt, they promised all sorts of things in order to get them to oppose the Assyrians, and then they didn't fulfill their promises. Hosea 8. <clears throat> Israel cries out to me, Our God, we acknowledge you. But Israel has rejected what is good, and the enemy will pursue him. <clears throat> all right, again, they, they have all the right words, and yet they reject what is good. So they don't really mean it. Their words are hollow. There's nothing to them. And so therefore, an enemy, which is the Assyrians, will pursue them. They set up kings without my assent. They choose princes without my approval. With their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves to their own destruction. Samaria, throw out your calf idol. Again, Jeroboam, the first king of the north, was not of the line of David. He was not. Um, God did not ordain him or any after him. As I mentioned, there were five kings that ruled after Jeroboam. Five kings in 13 years after him. Three of them took the throne by violence, by getting rid of their predecessor. And so God is judging them for that. And then he says, Samaria, throw out your calf idol. As I said earlier, Jeroboam the first, the first king of the northern king of Israel, set up two calves to be worshipped. Now, there was a calf god in Egypt. Remember, the Israelites came out of Egypt. And that's we believe that's why they set up a calf god um, when Moses was up on the mountain, and they convinced Aaron to create a golden calf for them. And that's why they had calves here. That was a popular god for worship in Egypt, and they carried those beliefs over with them. Um, my anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of purity? They are from Israel. Uh, uh, they are from Israel. This calf, a metal worker has made it. It is not God. Duh, somebody made this. Have you thought about that? It will be broken in pieces, that calf of Samaria. They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. That's a famous proverb. It means you reap what you sow. If you sow evil, you will reap evil. The stalk has no head. It will produce no flower. There's no productivity. You, you're not getting anywhere with this. Okay? Were it to yield grain, foreigners would swallow it up. Others will come in and take over. Israel is swallowed up, meaning lost. The northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed, the ten lost tribes in the north. Now she is among the nations like something no one wants. There's nothing there that anybody wants anymore. For they have gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has sold herself to lovers. Although they have sold themselves among the nations, I will now gather them together. They will begin to waste away under the oppression of the mighty king. Though Ephraim built many altars for sin offerings, which was one of the offerings that the Israelites would make, these have become altars for sinning. Play on words there. They were built initially as altars to God for sin offerings, which is part of their worship. Later on, they were offering uh, to other gods they are meaning they became altars for sinning. I wrote for them the many things of my law, but they regarded them as something foreign. They no longer acknowledge the fact that the law of Moses is something that has authority over their lives. It's something, oh, that was something they did back then. That's not for us. Though they offer sacrifices as gifts to me, and though they eat the meat, the Lord is not pleased with them. Now he will remember their wickedness and punish their sins. They will return to Egypt. Meaning, ritualism. They still do the sacrifices thinking that that's going to be okay. That's going to get them by. So I'm going to be happy with them. Well, I'm not. The, I'm not pleased with them. They are wicked. And I will punish their sins. When it says they will return to Egypt, it means they will again be taken captive. Egypt is a symbol for captivity for the ancient Israelites, of course, that Moses had brought them out of. They are going to go back into captivity. Egypt is a symbol there. Israel has forgotten their maker and built palaces. Judah has fortified many towns, but I will send fire on their cities and will consume their fortresses. In other words, they think that they're powerful because of human effort. Mm -hmm. This is the sin of Baal, okay? That we're good enough. You know, we've, done, we've built great cities, mighty palaces. What do we need God for? Well, God is going to show them that those things can be destroyed, okay? Stop me if you got any questions. I'm moving through this fairly quickly so we can get some more stuff in here, okay? And again, I've just picked out passages to kind of give you a flow through here. Hosea 9, starting with the 10th verse. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. A wonderful, refreshing, beautiful image. 
You know, like finding grapes in the desert. When they came to Baal Pe uh, Peor, which is the same as Beth Peor, it's called elsewhere, that, that there was an idol, uh, a high place there where they worshipped Baal. That's why they called it Baal Peor. They consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. This is recorded in both Jeremiah and in Judges, Jeremiah 2 and Judges 6, the, the worshipping of that idol in, in uh, Beth Peor. Ephraim's glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. How do you kill a people? Give them no children. Even if they rear children, I will bereave them of every one. Woe to them when I turn against them. This is a woe word. It's called. Woe to them. Um, I have seen Ephraim like Tyre planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim will bring out their children to the slayer. They will be destroyed. Even their children will suffer at the hands of the Assyrian army. Give them, Lord. What will you give them? Give them wombs that miscarry and breasts that are dry. This is hardcore stuff. It's not that Hosea is trying to curse them. It's that Hosea is reflecting God's judgment, his holy and righteous wrath against them. Because of all of their wickedness in Gilgal, again, there was a pagan shrine there, I hated them there. Because of their sinful deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will no longer love them. All their leaders are rebellious. Ephraim is blighted, their root is withered, they yield no fruit. Even if they bear children, I will slay their cherished offspring. My God will reject them because they have not obeyed him. They will be wanderers among the nations. Get the idea? God is not pleased. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Recognize that? Yes, I'd like an explanation. There's so much of of it in here. You'll get, uh, there are so many prophetic quotes that appear in the New Testament. This is actually from Matthew 2.15. It was uh, the idea that Jesus and the Holy Family, you know, Mary and Joseph, had to flee uh, Herod the Great, and they fled into Egypt. And then later on re returned after Herod was dead. And they quote there, it, was it says, it was in fulfillment of the prophecy, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I have called my son. Jesus was in Egypt for a while, and then, and then came back. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I'm the one that, you know, brought you up, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt, and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? Again, return to Egypt is a symbol for being taken into slavery. Not necessarily in Egypt, but by the Assyrians. A sword will flash in their cities, it will devour their false prophets, and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me the God Most High, I will by no means exalt them. You keep getting these places where they, they it sounds like they're saying the right thing. This is the ritualism. They don't mean it. They don't feel anything. They're not, their hearts are not to God, but they keep trying to say these words thinking they're somehow magic. That's the ritualism that God judges. And now, we finally get to the restoration part. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboiah? Adma and Zeboiah were two of the cities of the plain that were destroyed after Sodom. When Sodom was destroyed, they ended up being destroyed shortly after, and so they became a symbol for destruction. My heart has changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will, come, I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt, trembling like sparrows from Assyria, fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. So God will roar, the people will hear the roar, and even though they're frightened, they will return. He will take them back and give them a home again. And almost finished with Hosea. I've got two more slides here. But I have been the Lord your God ever since you came out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God but me, no Savior except me. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of burning heat. 
When I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. There's a wonderful passage that says, Lord, make me yet neither rich nor poor. For if I become rich, I may forget you. If I become poor, then I may do illegal things you know, in order to try to eat. Um, and so the idea is God provided so much, they began to assume it was them and not God. So I will be like a lion to them, like a leopard. I will lurk by the path, like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will attack them and rip them open. Like a lion, I will devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. You are destroyed, Israel, because you are against me, against your helper. Where is your king that he may save you? Where are your rulers in all your towns of whom you say, of whom you said, give me a king and princes? Remember, God told them a king was a bad idea from the very start, before Saul. And yet they demanded to have kings like the other nations. So in my anger I gave you a king, and in my wrath I took him away. The guilt of Ephraim is stored up, his sins are kept on record. Pains as of a woman in childbirth come to him, but he is a child without wisdom. When the time comes, he doesn't have the sense to come out of the womb. And finally... I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. At the very end, there is restoration. There is redemption. Where, O oh death, are your plagues? Where, O oh grave, is your destruction? Familiar? This, Paul quotes this in 1 Corinthians 15.55 as an affirmation of the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. You use in funerals quite well. What's that? It's used in Christian Yes. Funerals. Yep. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. That return thing, very strong. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. For in you the fatherless find compassion. So no more idolatry, no more claiming that something is a God that we made with our own hands, and we will show compassion to the fatherless. There's two of the three things that they had problems with. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots, his young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree, his fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. People will dwell again in his shade. They will flourish like the grain. They will blossom like the vine. Israel's fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I am like a flourishing juniper. Your fruitfulness comes from me. So in the end, there is the affirmation that God will restore. Not only will be a remnant that he restores, it will be a long time coming. A restoration will happen. Okay? Now, I know that's a lot for me to go over on Hosea, but I want you to get a feel for the kind of imagery, the kind of um, expressions, how it reflects uh, the prophetic message that, that uh, we find consistently in both the major and minor prophets. Let's spend a few minutes now looking at the book of Joel. The only thing we know about the prophet Joel is what we hear, and that is he is Joel, called to be a prophet, and is the son of Pethuel. There's no other reference to Joel of any content anywhere. He is quoted in the New Testament. For instance, um, a very powerful passage we'll look at is quoted by uh, Peter in the second chapter of Acts as an explanation for what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon the people and they speak in tongues. Okay? Now, we believe the date is either, what's up here, 605 B.C. to 587 B.C., or it's the late 8th century, which would be the, the 700s, you know, 705, etc. The difference is, do we believe that Joel is speaking about the invasion of the Babylonians to the southern kingdom of Judah? If so, that's the day. If he's talking about the Assyrians, then that would be 100 years earlier. Okay, So we're not sure which it is. But the theme is that the judgment of the great and terrible day of the Lord is like a locust plague. Again, so many people think the day of the Lord is a positive thing. To the prophets... There are a few places where they talk about the positive aspects of the day of the Lord, but for the most part, the day of the Lord is the day of destruction. It's the day of judgment. It's the day of, of condemnation and uh, of terrible things. And so the day of the Lord is when the locusts come to destroy everything the Joel. The purpose is to call for Judah's repentance or uh, Israel's repentance, depending upon what date you give this, by promising God's mercy if they do. The first... Um, 
The first 20 verses, well, the first chapter basically, is about judgment. Chapters 2 and 3 are about restoration. That same idea, judgment, restoration. And if you want a reference to this, especially um, related to locusts and the symbolism of locusts, Deuteronomy 28, verses 38 and 42, both are kind of the foundation for what Joel says. Let's look at some passages. <clears throat> the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethua. That's all we know about him. That's it. No other references to him historically, <clears throat> although he's, the, the book is quoted elsewhere. That's all we know about the prophet, and that name is not used anywhere else in Scripture. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all you who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Nothing Continuing, wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. This image of everything being eaten. And if you, if you know about locust swarms, they literally, and they actually had one uh, like 50 years ago, was the last major one they had in Egypt, um, it darkens the sky. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of insects, and they'll, they would land um, in an area, anything living would be eaten, no plants of any kind. You, you, you guys have uh, the leaf cutter ants? Okay, leaf cutter ants times 100 million. Nothing survived a major locust swarm. That's what we're talking about here. Everything is dead. No food left, no green left, no nothing left. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the betrothed of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The idea is, if you don't have any grapes, can't make wine, you can't have a drink offering. If you don't have any wheat left, everything's dead, you can't have any grain offerings. If you don't have anything to feed the animals, they're going to die. You're not going to have any animal sacrifices. The locusts destroy everything. The fields are ruined. The ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. The olive oil fails. Despair, you farmers. Wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees of the fields are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. So then Joel tells them what to do about it. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn, wail you who minister before the altar. Come before me the, the night in Come, spend the night in sackcloth. And sackcloth was like burlap. It was a symbol of mourning. To pour ashes over your head and wear sackcloth, coarse clothing was a sign of mourning. Spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas, for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. The day of the Lord. Everything is gone. Everything is destroyed. Chapter 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the town in the lands tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was of old, nor ever will be in ages to come. Now whether he's talking here about the Assyrian army coming into the north, or the Babylonian army coming into the south, that's what he's talking about in terms of this large and mighty army. Um, and both, both of those armies were considered at the time to be the most uh, extraordinary army ever put together. Symbolized by the locusts. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty are those who obey his command. The day of the Lord is great, it is dreadful. Who can endure it? Now God used both the Assyrian army and the Babylonian army to perform his will. 
even though they weren't Jews, even though they were you know, foreign Gentiles, God is the God of the whole world. And so therefore, he uses other forces to uh, fulfill his goals and objectives. And here's something you'll recognize. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Here's what to do about it. Rend your heart and not your garments. This is an internal thing, not just external ritualism. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. <coughs> this you should recognize. <coughs> and afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Recognize that? This is Peter in Acts 2 explaining what's going on when the Holy Spirit, <coughs> Joel said, in that day I will pour out my spirit on my people. Well, that happened in Acts 2, and that's what caused the people to speak in tongues, that the visitors to Jerusalem from around the whole eastern Mediterranean recognized their own languages. And then the restoration in Joel 3. In those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. This is a judgment against the nations. Now, They cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine to drink. Let the nations be roused, let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. This passage here, um, verse 16, the Lord will roar from Zion, is the one that gets quoted then early in the first chapter of Amos, which causes us the, that's the, the reason they were put in this order. Is there's believed to be a link there. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. He's talking prophetically about the future now. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Egypt, Edom was another, uh, again, Edom was descendant of Esau. Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem through all generations. Shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. So the vengeance against all of those who have done ill to the nation of Israel. I've got ten more minutes to deal with the prophet Amos. Um, Amos, we know specifically, quite exactly, when he was a prophet. He, we know him as prophet Amos of Tekoa. He says he is a shepherd. The word that's used there for shepherd is different than, than most places. Um, the, the indication is that he was either a breeder of sheep or he owned the livestock. He was more well-to-do than a typical shepherd who would have been the lowest rung on the social ladder. So he was of more significance. He also cares for sycamore fig trees. He identifies that he also does that. Uh, he, you'll notice there's only one day here, circa 760 B.C., because he very specifically tells us in, in Amos that he, had, he is ministering during the time of uh, Uzziah, king of Judah, and Jeroboam II, the king of Israel, and he even says that it occurs um, about the time of a major earthquake. And we think we know when that earthquake was because we have ruins that show that there was a major earthquake in this part of the world at that time. So we think 760 BC. The theme are eight major declarations of judgment against the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember, Hosea and Amos are prophesying against the northern kingdom of Israel. Joel, maybe, we don't know. Everybody else is prophesying against the southern kingdom of Judah. 
to declare judgment against Israel and promise eventual restoration. Sounds familiar? That's the purpose. There are eight prophecies, three sermons, five visions, and five promises. Very structured. Okay. And in it, Amos covers all three of the major prophetic points that you've broken the covenant and you better straighten up. No repentance, then judgment. And yet, for all of that judgment, there eventually will be restoration. And he also deals with all three of the main sins. The idea of idolatry, social injustice, and the uh, ritualistic false religion. Especially, Amos, though, is concerned about social injustice. Let justice roll down is from Amos, if you've ever heard that expression. A few passages here. First chapter, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. The visions he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake. There you get that earthquake thing. When Uzziah was the king of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Joash, was king of Israel. He said, the Lord roars from Zion. Remember that from just a second ago? We saw it in Joel. The, that, at the end of Joel and the start of uh, Amos leads us to believe there may be a connection there. The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel, that's Mount Carmel, withers. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, Damascus was the capital city of Syria. You remember Israel and Syria got together to attack Judah. From three sins, uh, for three sins of Damascus, <laughs> even for four, I will not relent. This is an example of, Israel, uh, of Israelite poetry. They would say, you know, there are five things I ask of God, six things indeed I require. And it's a, it's a parallelism that you find happening over and over. Amos has it all the way through here. Um, so, three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent, because she threshed Gilead with, sh with sledges having iron teeth. I will send fire on the house of Hazael and will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gates of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile in Tukir, said the Lord. Uh, Aram and Damascus are the same thing. This is all a judgment against one people, and that is the Syrian people, Damascus, um, so the, the nation of Syria. He then goes on, Amos does, and has prophecies against eight total uh, kingdoms. He talks about Philistia, which is also uh, uh, which is also called Gaza. That's where the, the Philistines were from. Philistia, Gaza, along the, the coast. Phoenicia, and he refers to Ashdod and Tyre, to the cities in Phoenicia. Edom, Ammon, Moab, yet Edom, descendants of Esau, Ammon, uh, and Moab, descendants of Lot. And he has curses very similar to this to all of those. And then he leaves the Gentile nations that he's cursed and deals with Judah and Israel. This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees. Because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods their ancestors followed, I will send fire on Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, the northern kingdom, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver, the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. So he specifically identifies that among the sins of Judah, the southern kingdom, um, is that they are led astray to false gods, idolatry. Then he talks about Israel, the northern kingdom, and the, the sin he particularly condemns them of is selling the innocent for silver, in other words, keeping your, you know, making money off of the poor, trampling the heads of the poor, denying justice to the oppressed. And he goes on in chapter 3, hear this, hear this word, people of Israel, the word the Lord has spoken against you, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt, you only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. He chose them to be his people. He gave them clear directions, and they violated it. So they particularly are to be punished. Do two walk together unless they've agreed to do so? Does a lion roar in the thicket when it has no prey? Does it growl in its den when it has caught nothing? Does a bird swoop down to a trap on the ground when no bait is there? Does a trap spring from the ground if it has not caught anything? When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, well, has not the Lord caused it? He's saying all of these signs, you should know it's coming, folks. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servant, the prophets. 
God has given the message to the prophets, all of the warning signs, which are reflected in various symbolism here, and yet you have not paid attention. You have rejected the prophets. That was the, that was the claim against the nation of Israel throughout its history. Jesus affirmed that. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. An enemy will overrun your land, pull down your strongholds, and plunder your fortresses. This is what the Lord says. As a shepherd rescues from the lion's mouth only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites living in Samaria be rescued, but only the head of a bed and a piece of fabric from a couch. Remember the remnant? That only a very few? He uses a very vivid graphic here. That, yeah, you may be able to save part of the, um, the lamb out of the lion's mouth, but only part, a small part of that. Hear this and testify against the descendants of Jacob, declares the Lord, the God Almighty. On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. The stone altars back then would have corners that came up, which, which were called the horns. And they were just sort of to give on the four points kind of a boundary so that they could stack stuff inside wood, altar, um, things to be sacrificed, uh, etc. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house. The houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed, and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. Almost done. This is what the Lord says to Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. These are places where they had pagan altars. For Gilgal will surely go into exile, and Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, for he will sweep through the tribes of Joseph like a fire. It will devour you, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. There are those who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. Again, Amos especially focuses on justice for those in need. He who made the Pleiades and Orion, these are the stars, he who made the uh, Pleiades, excuse me, the Pleiades and Orion, who turns midnight to dark, and, uh, to dawn and darkens day into night. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out of the face of the land. The Lord is his name. With a blinding flash, he destroys the stronghold and brings the fortified city to ruin. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as he said he is. Hate evil, love good. Maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Um, I want to, I'm going to skip... Head to the final. Great description in 11, or sorry, verse 18 on the day of the Lord. Yes. Uh, which chapter are you looking at? Uh, um, five. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and actually here, away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-falling stream. That's a very popular, let justice roll on like a river, as, a, as a, a very vivid image of the desire for justice for those who are oppressed. Okay? And I want to go to the last one, because it is the ultimate um, promise of restoration. Again, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of God. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day, the lovely young woman and strong young men will faint because of thirst. Again, this is thirst for the word of God, for knowing God. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, as surely as your God lives, Dan, or as surely as the gods of Beersheba live, they will fall, never to rise again. And then... In that day, I will restore. Uh, that's another one. I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins, and will rebuild it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name. Declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, and I will bring my people Israel back from exile. Remember, for the Jewish people, that's the definition of salvation, to be brought back from exile, the idea of return. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land and never again to be uprooted from the land I've given them, says the Lord your God. That's the ultimate promise. 
That's the, that's the restoration of Israel. Okay? And that's the book of Amos. Any questions about any of these three or anything else we've talked about today? Just yes. very quickly, I missed one. I think the prophecies against idolatry, social injustice, and what was the... And uh, ritual, false religion, ritualistic religion, just going through the motions without really meaning. And that's true with all the prophetic books. We talked about that in the major prophets as well. Okay? Thank you all very much.